everybody. Co welcome to a special edition of Hashing Out the Law. This is the Criminal Courts Bar Association edition of Hashing Out the Law. And my first guest is a board member of the Criminal Courts Bar Association, Mr. Austin Dove. How are you, Austin? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, Rosh. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Now, Austin, you joined the board this, well, last year, technically, correct? Yeah, I think I came on in, in 2019. 2019. I lose, I lose track because of COVID. Everything is mixed up in my calendar, in my head. I raced the whole year. Yeah. <laughs> but so you, you joined the board. But Austin, you've been practicing for a while. Tell us a little bit about when you started practicing and how you became a lawyer or, or what drove you to become a lawyer. Yeah, well, so I started practicing. I became a lawyer in 1995, and my, my first practice, where I first be, became, because I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to be in court, and I wanted to, I, my sort of the whole notion of me becoming a lawyer was to become a trial lawyer. That was that was my beginning goal and my ultimate goal. I kind of took a little detour along the way because in law school they kind of convince you that you ought to go to big firms. So I did work for a big firm for a few years. Uh, from called Holland and Knight. And then I also um, worked for a stint of time at the Riverside DA's office. And all that, you know, DA's office first and then over to a big firm was kind of like, there was this fire simmering in me, uh, this idea that I had to get back into a courtroom. I knew that a big firm wasn't really the place for that. So I, I uh, took an opportunity, started a practice, I actually had a friend of mine and I started practice and I really dug into criminal defense and and really haven't looked back. It's been a, a, a great and fun ride for me and a very meaningful ride. That's awesome. Now, all of us who are attorneys, there is a point in our life where whether we are kids or adults, there's a point in our life where something gets in our head and it says, be a lawyer. And, and you say, yeah. be a lawyer. What point in your life was that? And what happened that that point occurred? Yeah, you know, I actually do remember that point. There may have been a couple of points, but uh, I remember my, my older brother took me to see a film that was kind of above, above my head. I think I was probably like in the, you know, the ninth grade or something like that. And there was a film that came out called, and, and I'm not sure if it was a new film at the time, but it was a movie called The Verdict with Paul Newman. And so I remember watching that film and it's a dramatic story about how he was kind of a lawyer that had been great and fallen down on his luck and wasn't really doing too well, was blowing off cases and missing deadlines. And ultimately it all came down to him trying this very heavy case for a family. I think I wanna say it was against the archdiocese or something like that. And uh, after not advising of a, of a settlement, which they probably should have taken or would have taken, he ends up having all stakes on the trial. I love the drama, the theater, the gamesmanship of the courtroom. And I thought, wow, that would be interesting. And that's when that first seed happen. Uh, I, another part of it is a, a seed is only kind of um, watered or comes to fruition when you actually connect it with a real person. There weren't lawyers in my family, didn't know a lot of lawyers in my, my community, but uh, a friend of ours, of my family's a little bit older than us, uh, was at, I met him, I ran to him at a park when I was basically like a, in high school and he said, oh yeah, I'm at, I'm at SC Law now. And I thought, wow, this is like a kid from the neighborhood. And he's, he was at USC Law and he said, yeah, I got, I'm working for a firm. He said, Paul Hastings, you're doing some summer thing there. And he told me how much to pay. And I'm like, okay, that was kind of the second hook. It was that part, but it was actually just seeing a real person that you knew, a relatable guy uh, that you could say, you know what? Um, then that, that little idea I had, and now I'm you know, finishing high school. I thought, yeah, this might be something I'm gonna throw into. Awesome. Now you mentioned you ran into the guy from the neighborhood who went to SC Law. So I'm assuming mm. you're an LA native. Yes, yeah, I, I grew up in, uh, in kind of two cities. I was, we, we moved up north for a short period of time, a couple of years, but I grew up in, born and raised in Compton, California. And then uh, for middle school, high school, we moved to a, pretty much an adjacent city, Linwood. So those, those two cities were kind of the predominant parts of my growing up. And, and you, it's a good question, Ross, because a lot of that, that part uh, of growing up in those places, uh, I felt were so misunderstood by a lot of people. 
Uh, my dad is a, a city planner. He was high up at the Department of Transportation. My mom's an RN. Uh, all my siblings either went to at least undergrad, if not, you know, got advanced degrees. Much was true for most of my block. Uh, we lived on maybe what was called the, the west side or the better side of Compton. But from the outside, people thought of it all as one big same thing. Uh, but there were, you know, issues and things that developed along the way with the way government uh, interacted with us, with opportunities that were lost for people. And I just got to see a real microcosm intimately of what can be right and what can be wrong with the government, with policing. And so, uh, and having seen those things firsthand and, and literally the first time a gun was ever pulled on me or pointed at me was by a police officer when I was about 15 years old. And I'm just, you know, walking with a, a friend of mine. We, are, we had been in a car and get out of the car. And, you know, I never had a gun point at me. And not only did he point the gun at me, he literally put the muzzle of the gun in the back of my head. He said, I'm gonna search you now, so don't move. So, you know, those kind of things will spark an interest in you to do something about that. And, you know, no matter where you go, no matter how, you know, you might have I've had civil cases that were really nice, you know, settlements. There's that uh, part of you that says, I want to address that kind of thing, because that's so fundamental to what it means to represent people when they're really at that point where they're, um, they're juxtaposed against a much greater power. And you know, we as defense attorneys have that really, really critical role to not just you know go in court and do the check the boxes, but to really try to understand them, to really try to reach into getting them and who they are. And that's really uh, why I really kind of you know kind of segued back to criminal. So let me ask you this: um, You stated you worked for the DA's office at some point in your career. Yes. Yes. What was that like being on the other side? When I say other side of the law, I'm talking about now you're on, you're a defense attorney on that, that time in your career, you were on the other side of the law, not saying there's a wrong or a right side, but yeah. what was it like being a, a, a prosecutor? Well, you know, so it was a short stint and it was over at Riverside DA's office. And, and you know, actually there are pluses and minuses. And I do think that one of the reasons why I went to that office is there was a, a lady that was recruiting and, uh, you know, she made the point that, you know, um, you know, a black voice is important to be in that office too, because you want to make sure that justice is evenly administered. And, uh, but the, and so she tells a story about, you know, black victims being important and black, you know, um, prosecution playing a very critical role and we don't want to be left out of that. That was really kind of the, the hook that got me in, but really a rush, it was about the opportunity to try cases. And at the time, um, there were, I, I think there were some hiring limitations in LA. So uh, with budget, just around that time I came in. So I kind of took the place where I can get in the courtroom. That experience for me though, was a good experience, if for no other reason than it underscored uh, my, you kind of really get into the belly of the, I don't want to say belly of the beast to say that prosecutions are, are all bad people, but you can certainly see some of the biases, the misunderstanding, the, the painting with the wide brush, the looking the other way on police um, misconduct, becoming really, really friendly with the cops and um, this sort of team approach that can lead to um, you know, uh, bureaucracy over fairness or justice. And, and so that really kind of really emerged to me and I was like, I, I became very clear to me that there were just major flaws in this system. And, and actually it was really, um, I did go to a firm after that and then, but in my mind I said, I wanna get out there and I wanna get back in the courtroom and I wanna be on the defense side. And uh, so in fairly short order, I was able to get to doing what I really wanted to do. So let me ask you a question. You said the lady approached you, there was a hook, you know, to come in, be the black voice on the prosecution side and, and help. Did you actually get an opportunity to, to have your voice heard and, and help the community? See, uh, that's a very good question from a, a learned practitioner because you're a low man on the totem pole. So you can kind of, you can write a memo, you can make observations. I remember one case I was handling and it was pretty apparent to me that there was a bad search. Uh, even though, I mean, I knew the Fourth Amendment, I knew what was right and wrong about 
contacting a defendant. And this officer had put in there that he had seen this uh, a protruding object from an individual's you know, pants uh, across the parking lot at midnight, you know, 10 o'clock midnight at a closed um, mall. This individual was unhoused or homeless, as it used to say, pushing a basket. And it was cold, Riverside gets cold at night, and he had several layers of pants on. And so and it was a small knife, about a four, three or four inch knife, just slightly over what, what they call the Dirk or Dagger limitation. And you know, he says, I saw this, and then we start looking at Maggie, he said, well, this guy's got all these pants on, this thing's small, at, way at the bottom of his pocket, there's no way you saw from across the parking lot this bulge and said, I gotta check this guy. So, you know, I said, I think we got a problem. The defense had filed a motion to suppress the knife and based on that, and I went to my supervisor and she said to me, well, our, our officer, she said, I know you are from LA and you, you probably saw that the Rodney King uh, situation. We don't have cops that do that out here. That's what she said. So she assured me that, that, that our cops in Riverside couldn't be dishonest and couldn't have exaggerated or fabricated and, and that really, you know, another thing in Rosh that made me think, yeah, I got to get out of here. This is the, this is not going to fly. And, uh, you know, you're there uh, to your point, kind of trying to make a difference. And by the way, the, the defendant in that case wasn't even a black guy. It was just, you know, I think it was a Caucasian man, but it was just you know, a well taken point. I did see incidents where, uh, and the statistics are undeniable nationally. Now we finally know there's kind of a reckoning happening that it tilted a lot worse for individuals of, of color. Now, Austin, you're, you're now on the defense side and you're, you're practicing and, and you're in the courtroom, which I can relate to because I love being in the courtroom myself. Uh, what are you doing when you're not in the courtroom? What does Austin Dove do on his day off? Well, I got a 16 year old and a 13 year old. And so I spent a lot of time with them. I've got a wife who's um, up in, she's actually in Sacramento. She's in the state assembly. So we kind of, you know, help each other out with that. She sits on a, a couple of the committees that are really involved in, in writing laws, making laws. She's an elected official plug. Uh, she's running for <laughs> the Senate right now and, and has got an election on March 2nd, a special election. She's the odds on favorite. She's been really working really hard and it's super bright. Uh, so with that, you know, the family is my big focus out of here. Uh, I also work with a group of lawyers um, uh, called the Justice X Law Group. And um, partly because of what I was saying about these systemic wrongs, uh, these guys are really, really experienced and even the very best in the business at civil rights litigation and then class action litigation. We have a team and we've got a number of class action, um, uh, actually a big ticket class action lawsuit going on, a number of other lawsuits. They really are addressing, addressing kind of police reforms. And so our, our law group has taken on uh, LAPD in a case that's now in federal course, court, pending class certification likely to get that uh, for the, um, the falsification of um, the gang database. And so we've got a lot of plans for representing, we'll be representing and uh, getting that case through litigation. That's kind of another passion of mine. It was a natural extension of Rosh from the work that we were doing, uh, what work I've been doing in defense side. And then uh, I cycle, I love getting on bikes and riding 40, 50 miles, uh, do a little bit of martial arts. Those are kind of things that, that, that get me going. Nice. So if I need a, a bouncer when I'm in court, you're gonna be like that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be the guy running. <laughs> Uh, my very last question for you, Austin, is there something that people do not know about you that you would like them to know? Well, you know, I, I, I guess I think I, I fancy myself a, a writer. Um, I fancy myself, I kind of really get into a deep dive on like literature. I, I probably read too much sometimes. I, I can go all off into like odd spaces of this kind of picking up literature stuff. And um, so that's probably one of the most things I, I sometimes play the guitar. I'm not very good at it. I was put it down too long. The um, yeah, that's kind of it. You know, those are like the, the passions, the things that not everyone knows 
the sort of uh, the, the, the quieter side, because like yourself, Arash, in court, you know, I tend to be, there tends to be some bravado, but, but actually inside, I kind of just like the quieter kind of moments. Um, and, um, you know, and then, you know, a lot of interest in travel. I, I travel a ton when it was open, I would go anywhere and everywhere. And, uh, and I've been to a lot of different countries. I've been to almost every, co every continent. Um, and so just got a lot of time to, to, you know, spend in those spaces too. That's awesome. I learned a lot about you. I, I hope, uh, our viewers and listeners learn a lot about you. It was a pleasure. Uh, and I wish you luck and I will see you soon. All right. Thanks for the opportunity, Rosh. Thank you.